I can't hear anybody. <laughs> oh. There we go. Can you hear me? No? Hi, ma'am. Uh, this is Commissioner Allman. We can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jose, can we get the uh, slides back up, please? <clears throat> Thanks. This is Commissioner Zito, uh, Chair, uh, calling this meeting to order. Uh, next slide, please. All right, for Pledge of Allegiance, Commissioner Allman, do you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Will do, Chair. Uh, if you're able to stand, please stand and raise your hand over your or place your hand over your heart or stand at the position of attention and salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individuals with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. Next slide, please. Stephanie, if you can do the roll call, please. Commissioner Leal. Present. Commissioner Jackson Kelly. Commissioner McFadden. Commissioner Allman. Present. Chair Zato. Present. Um, Vice Chair Noyola. Present. Commissioner Gutierrez. Present. And just one more time. Commissioner Leal. I'm present if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Got it. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Commissioner Jackson Kelly. And then Commissioner McFadden. I'm sorry, I also forgot Commissioner Anderson. Present. I think I've seen you on. Okay. Um, Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Stephanie. Next slide, please. All right, I'm hoping all the commissioners were able to review the uh, commission meeting minutes from December. Uh, if there's no issues, please uh, need someone to make a motion and a second. Motion to approve. Second. All right, that was uh, the vice, I believe, and uh, Commissioner uh, Anderson seconded. Correct. Stephanie, can you do a roll call, please, for the vote? Stephanie, are you able to do uh, a roll call for the vote? Um, Chairman Zato? Yes. Approved. Vice Chair Noyola? Approved. Commissioner Leal? Approved. Commissioner Allman? Approved. Commissioner Gutierrez? Approved. 
Commissioner Anderson. Approve. Okay. Everyone's voted yet. All righty. Thank you, Stephanie. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to keep the uh, chairman report very short and sweet so we can ha have more time for presentations and uh, discussion. Uh, you can see the go delivery for this notice went out last week. Um, if you need to subscribe, please subscribe. Send uh, your email to info at mba.lacounty.gov. Um, and we do, and all these meetings are posted uh, on the YouTube channel on under LA, Veter LA County Military and Veteran Affairs. That's all I have. Uh, next slide. All right, we currently have uh, five people signed up for public comment. Um, we'll go in order and you all have three minutes. Mr. Garcia, are you present? Yes, I am. Sir, I'll start the time once you start, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to say that I am opposed to Sandra Burke as an artist for the uh, VA's uh, uh, Metro Purple Lines uh, mural. Uh, for one, I think most of us have seen his previous work, uh, The Depravities of War, where he portrays a lot of veterans in very poor light. Uh, there's one particular painting that, that's pretty disturbing. Uh, it shows what appears to be a little girl uh, maybe six, seven, eight years old, sitting on a veteran's lap, uh, and she appears pregnant. Uh, at the floor, on the, the, the veteran sitting down on the couch, on the floor is what appears, I guess, maybe his son, uh, similar in age, playing with naked Barbie dolls, uh, posed in very sexual manners. Um, and the title of that painting is, Daddy, What Did You Do in the Great War? Um, another very disturbing painting is that one painting side by side has images of Vietnam veterans uh, killing civilians. And then on the other uh, end of, of that painting is, is Vietnam veterans standing behind a 7-Eleven, relieving themselves and begging for change. As a veteran, I'm all about freedom of expression. I'm all about having the right to say what, what you want and, 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 and to feel how you want. However, um, that's not how most veterans feel about themselves. And we certainly don't want that a veteran, a, some, a civilian that feels that way about us. We don't want to see his work in, in, in a place that is somewhat hollowed, holy ground for us. Uh, this land was donated, was deeded to house to help veterans. Um, and if we're going to have a public train stop there, at the very least, we could do as much as we can they to called, help they called, uh, veterans. Uh, I, I, from Nelson. I think, think someone's not on mute. Um, but I would just like to say that if, if this train stop is going to happen and art is going to be put up, it should be veteran artists, veterans that, that are not artists. There's plenty of us out there struggling uh, to find work. And these are the people that should be employed. And it should be scenes that depict Americanism, that depict uh, veterans in, in, in the light, that we see ourselves as, as, as people that bring freedom, as freedom fighters, as lovers of our country and of our page and, and, and of our, of our, of, our, uh, of the citizens and, 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 and uh, our country. This this man, I don't know how he feels or what he, he truly feels about veterans, but just the fact that he could express, put paint to, to canvas and, and, and show us in that light, um, at least says subconsciously that he feels some way like that about veterans. Um, I, I truly do not. Uh, I also believe that uh, Metro did not do its due diligence in, in getting uh, veterans for. input on this mural. Can I just have 10 seconds since I was interrupted for a little bit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the reason I say that is I, I do month. I, I help coordinate monthly events on the VA for the CTRS residents. I am part of the Marine Corps League here in L.A. I'm part of the Veterans Foreign Wars. I am part of the American Legion. 
I'm an active member in all the in, 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 in all those organizations, and nobody, nobody knows about this mural. Nobody knew about this artist. Nobody knew this was happening. So Metro did not do its due diligence in seeking out veteran input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Reynolds, are you on? Yes. I'll start the time once you start, sir. Sounds good. All right, I think um, what would be helpful, helpful in, in meetings moving forward is if, you know, Metro or, and when these presentations happen, if they could happen before public comments, so that way we could hear what they have to say and then have a chance to comment on it. Um, that said, I know that uh, Metro is going to try to make a strong case that they've done, they have done outreach to veterans. Uh, but the fact is they have not, we would not be here today if they had done adequate outreach to veterans on the property. Um, just like you heard Diego say, a lot of us have events, events on the land all the time to support the veterans at CTRS. Um, we never heard anything about it. Not, none of the veterans that we work with heard anything about it. And this is really a missed opportunity by Metro to actually get input from veterans. Um, the train is already a point of contention. We weren't even notified that construction for that train was going to begin in 2019 the VA we just started seeing construction happening trees getting cut down and the train starting to be built and that's how we found out about it so the train was already a point of contention so metro really needs to get their act together and do a better job of outreach work with people moving forward and come up with a plan that veterans are going to be happy with because if the train does have to be there this needs to be something the artwork needs to be something that depicts the history of what this property is and gives veterans a chance to be part of it. I think that that could be something that's really important. And so I hope this um, advisory commission takes everyone's public comment into account and everything that's uh, been going on with Metro and comes up with some good recommendations to correct this. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Arian, are you on? Alfred, Arian? Okay, we'll uh, sign, see you sign back on later, sir. Uh, Ms. Jessica Miles? Ms. Miles, are you on? Okay, we'll try you again in a minute. Mr. Morales, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Just go ahead. Hey. I'll start the time when you begin. Hey, I um, want to apologize because I've been in Nevada here over the weekend avoiding the rain in LA. It, it hit us in Henderson, Seven Hills. But I wanted to come to this meeting today to address you on uh, a very important topic. But before I do, I want to commend uh, Diego Garcia, who spoke about that mural project, and also Rob Reynolds. Um, I have uh, been photographing that area with my cell phone and have extensive photographs of the murals because we were there when we created those murals. Um, uh, Rick Sykes, Chad, um, all of us. And that is a treasure. That is a historical treasure that was created and initiated by the Vietnam veterans many years ago uh, with new directions uh, with John Kevney and all the people that, uh, that made it possible for that mural to exist. And uh, those names are so recorded on the walls there. But um, that's not why I'm here today. Why I'm here today is because we are able to do a lot of the things that we're doing. And this commission, uh, which was uh, 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 made aware of this over 30 years ago in the 1990s, that this building that this commission meets in has a very significant historical value, a national historical value. When we initiated plans to convert this building into a national landmark in the 1990s, uh, the director at the time said, uh, we can't do that because the building hasn't been fixed yet. And, uh, and uh, we, once it becomes a national landmark, uh, you, you're limited to what you can do with it. Uh, we suffered through all that, uh, those, those changes that we wanted to, or the, those status, but we are now very much eligible to make this building and to declare this building 
the national treasure that it is. I'm speaking specifically about Bobo Patriotic Hall. Um, I've been involved with this building since the 1940s as a young boy. Uh, I went to school just a few blocks from here, the eighth grade. Um, I was uh, friends and was introduced by my father to uh, the second director, Norm Kelly, and I've known every single director. Uh, Mo Nakasako and I uh, worked together very closely when he became the director. Uh, if Dan Ortiz is listening, Moat Nagasako, by the way, was our state VFW service officer before you, Dan. And Moat was a World War II veteran and quite a quite a, a, a good guy who passed away sitting at his desk here on this first floor of Patriotic Hall. I think that what Jim Denner and all of the veterans that work in this building are doing and all the work that is here, if the World War I veterans that that came to me and asked me to help to save and preserve this building back in the 1970s. If they were alive today, they would marvel oh, no. and applaud everything. So my reason for being here is to commence the project, the process through the Dep United States government, Department of Interior, to declare Patriotic Hall a national historical monument in time for its 100th centennial the centennial year will begin the 24th of July of 2024, next year, approximately 18 months from now. And it takes a minimum of 15 to 18 months to acquire national landmark status. So Sorry, the process has, has to begin now. So that's my purpose in being here. Uh, and any other questions you may have about this building? Uh, um, I, I love this place. I've loved it since I was in grammar school. And I intend to, as long as God gives me time on this earth, to be able to fight to make this recognized. Um, okay. Thank you. Hey, I see a message from Dan here. Glad to hear from you, Dan. I'm hanging in there, partner, fighting the cancer. I'm in the time's up. Thank you, sir. Thank you for You're your welcome. That's it. Um, Thank you. Uh, we're going to swing back around and see if Mr. Uh, Alfred Arian is available. Mr. Arian? Okay. Uh, we're trying Ms. Jessica Miles one more time. Ms. Miles, are you available? Yes, yes. yes sir. Oh, okay, Alfred. Okay, hey, I go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just, you know, I got in late, man. I apologize for that. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts. I'm just trying to gather some information on basically what uh, your organization is and what you are doing to assist our veterans. And I don't know if that's appropriate right now, but I'd like to discuss this further as more people discuss the issues that are pertaining to them. Is that okay? Sort of public comment period is for you to uh, make statements. Um, it's, it's not an interactive. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, is this in reference to the West LA VA hospital and the issues going to the veteran land? So if you have a statement regarding that, you can make a comment. Um, just meeting. Yeah. Okay. 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 Big. okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, you know, um, I'm doing this Zoom stuff and phone banking, but we do have some very important issues pertaining to our land and, and uh, uh, our veteran land, the National Homeless Disabled Veterans Soldiers Home, as we call it. You know, we have some issues with the mural that, that they want to possibly uh, remove and um, put their own um, mural on there. You know, we oppose that. We do not agree with what they're doing. This is, uh, I call it a historical land historical site where we have our veterans uh, emblems there over 100 200 uh, veteran emblems uh, we have um, the artist who was uh, Okay, I just got muted and I just got unmuted right now. So in saying that we oppose it, we uh, have a lot of issues in reference to these. 
uh, people that are taking control of our land, which is UCLA and Brentwood, where they have over 50 years with no improvement of transitional housing. They're multi-million dollar uh, businesses, uh, haven't done anything to help our veterans. And I'd like to say that uh, that land is not their land. That land is our land. The Ninth Circuit Court told them that they had to be removed and they're still finding some way to uh, stay there. Uh, they're growing things for their own benefit, not for our veterans in reference to transitional housing. Uh, it's a mess. And we need some people to listen to us and help us to uh, get to the evidence of, of the truth. And the truth is there. The evidence is there. And we need you to look into this. We need uh, people to take a look at the evidence that we have. And I hope to see justice soon, which means get all these corrupt people that are still in our land off that land and i'll leave it like that thank you thank you mr arian uh miss jessica miles miss miles because i did get a response that the request was submitted if i could just uh, have it for three minutes if jessica's not here i did register to speak just a minute please uh, we, we have time. Well, we got we have a slot for you, sir. Yeah. Last call for Miss Miles. All right. Uh, we're gonna add Mr. Senate and Mr. Tucker. We've got time for. Uh, so you got three minutes, Mr. Senate. All right. So I'm not sure that this Veterans Advisory Commission has any authority at all. I'm not sure why the city has any jurisdiction on national land. It's super sad that you have advocates and veterans bothered about the artists, which I would agree was very distasteful. Unfortunately, the distasteful art would be something that I don't think anyone should have to look at. The reality is that the Metro does not principally benefit veterans. It benefits Brentwood in a town center. The Metro is gonna create and going to allow Los Angeles to continue being the nation's capital of veteran homelessness. Metro, Brentwood School, UCLA, all of those entities have continually been prioritized over veterans remaining in tents and waking up on the curb. So the idea that we're up in arms about the artists, I think you have everyone fooled. I don't think that's a worthy, noble, just cause I don't think this commission has any jurisdiction over anything. And I think that people are gonna start waking up and realizing that Metro and private interest should not be prioritized. The land National Soldiers Home was over 900 acres donated in 1888 to be a soldier's home. The deed is very specific and says home many times. It doesn't say to have good transportation for the residents in LA to get to breakfast. So I want to make it clear that advocates, veterans do not want Metro and that the idea that the art being chosen is, is a, it, it's very sad that you have veteran schools that this illegal Metro is too late for their voice to be heard to make any change. I don't believe that. If you look in history, things are reversed. If you look at the Keystone Pipeline, it's just public interest and in people to speak up, to protest, and to demand change. And I still understand why we're talking about art. We're talking about infrastructure and money going to something that does not principally benefit veterans. I have on record, Kazoo, the Congress member saying that anything on the National Soldiers Fund that does not principally benefit veterans is illegal. I don't think anyone here can, can justify that the Metro principally benefit veterans. It does not. It benefits traffic for residents of Los Angeles to get to Brentwood. It will benefit a town center that I think you all support. The town center does not help or benefit veterans. Veterans should not be waking up on the street and tents and curse. The West LADA is funded over $900 million why are there all the veterans waking up on a curb? Your little meeting has no jurisdiction over that property. Your Veterans Commission is, in my opinion, a joke. Metro does not principally benefit veterans. That is not my opinion. 
Uh, sir, sir, your time's up. Here, pick me out because I'm not leaving, and I'll continue saying. Thank you for a comment, Mr. Senate. Mr. Tucker, are you available? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. I'll start your timer once you begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon okay. to the Mil Military and Veterans Affairs Commission, Mr. Chair, um, Jim Zenner, uh, Director of MVA and fellow commissioners as well. As a previous commissioner, a couple things. Um, I wanted to just mention to you from a metro standpoint and an employment standpoint, two things that I'm working on that's going to be big for LA County, as you know, homeless population and justice impacted um, are two of LA County touch points and pain points. Um, and so metro, I'm working on two programs that I get to spearhead as director of HR. One of those programs is the fair chance and justice impacted employment opportunity here at Metro and I get to run and spearhead that program and so just for the commission's sake and for knowledge base I'm working on some slides and I'll make sure that I tune in next month to make sure I really do a proper briefing to the group but just a quick heads up uh, Metro is in the fair chance arena and we know of some veterans that have been justice impacted and so it impacts them so working with communities like anti-recidivism coalition um uh, um, friends outside, homeboy and homegirl industries, um, CEO Works, uh, Chrysalis, Weingart, those agencies that have fair chance employment uh, candidates and making sure they are employed here at Metro. And so we're, um, we aspire to create that hiring pipeline for the justice impacted individuals. And some of us know veterans that have been justice impacted. Um, and so we're working for the employment piece for veterans. The second piece is creation of a program we are calling Room to Work, where we're taking unhoused individuals off the street, getting them into proper case management and employing them at Metro. And I get to spearhead those two major efforts in addition to the veteran hiring initiative that we already and you folks already currently know. So just wanted to kind of drop a bug into the commission's air. Wanted to stay within my three minutes or so, um, but I am putting together some proper slides and having my team brief the commission. So um, awareness is something that I'm going to work on for this fiscal year. Obviously, we're post COVID and getting back to where relationships are built and folks know about the knowledge and skills and attributes that Metro can provide on behalf of veterans and their families yeah, that's and that's their um, dependents is what I aspire to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Uh, that concludes our public comment period. We're going to move Private. forward. Next slide. Ms. Carpio, are you available? We have a presentation requested by Commissioner on the Department of Labor's Women's Bureau. Hi, this is Jennifer Fritzel speaking. Um, Leah, Leah Carpio Hernandez is my coworker and she's on detail, so I'll be filling in for her today. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Are you sharing my slides or am I able to share my, my screen? Jose, is she able to share her slides or? Uh, yes, yeah, she's able to share her slides. Okay, okay you should be able to share, ma'am. Perfect, thank you. Give me one second as I pull that up. You should be able to see my screen. We can see it, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to meet with the Los um, Angeles Veterans Advisory Com Commission. I'm really thankful for the time and this platform to introduce to you who I am and introduce to you the Women's Bureau. Um, I am Jennifer Fritzel. I am a program analyst with the Women's Bureau Western Region. My team does consist of Kelly Jenkins Paltz, regional administrator, and Leo Carpio Hernandez, program analyst, like I shared, who's currently on detail. Um, so thank you so much. I will be sharing over the next few minutes a little overview of who we are and what we do. All right, so the Women's Bureau is broken up into six different regions. 
Uh, the Western region who I represent consists of Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Montana, Arizona, Nevada, California, Guam, and the America Samoa Islands. And we do have a large reach and do our best with staying connected to our communities the best that we can. Some of you may have never heard of the Women's Bureau. So as I introduce to you who, you, who we are and what we do and how we serve the community, I think you'll be um, pleasantly excited and surprised. Um, interestingly, we are the only federal agency that champions policy change and standards to safeguard the interests of working women and their families. Uh, we were established over 102 years ago. So 100 and, our 103rd anniversary will take place on June 5th of 1920. Um, I'm sorry, 2023, my bad. Um, what makes us unique is that we serve as a trusted source for research data and statistics, and we offer strong advocacy efforts. Um, as a Western Regional employee, I'm responsible for educating our communities and engaging in outreach. Our national office is responsible for regional oversight as well as the policy analysis and offers grant making opportunities, which I'll share a little bit about those two grants here in a moment. So while we don't write policy change, we do have a strong influence on legislative changes that affect working women. Um, some of those convenings have led to the passage of landmark legislation for wage earning women and their families. For example, the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Equal Pay Act. A few of our priorities this fiscal year, um, through the work we focus on closing the gender and racial wage gap by disrupting occupational segregation and creating pathways for women to access higher paying jobs and raising wages in jobs where women are concentrated. Um, we also focus on eliminating the penalty women face as primary caretakers. A lot of women carry the full responsibilities of managing their families and caring for their elder family members, along with their, their own children that they raise. Um, we also lead in conversations with addressing discrimination in the workplace. And, are committed to worker rights, um, building economic stability for families, and resetting the playing field for women in the workplace. In order for us to support working women and create an equitable workforce, it's important that we identify and improve the policies and practices that perpetuate the gender racial disparities in employment. Um, some of those disparities are like the lack of child care or lack of elder care options, um, lack of paid leave, um, access um, workplace discrimination, for example. We recognize that the issues don't only affect women, but they also affect men. Um, where there's a disruption related to childcare or paid leave, the bigger picture is the issues affect the entire family unit. So through our work, unlike many of the other federal agencies, um, the Women's Bureau is not an enforcement agency. However, we are uniquely established to be able to support our communities. So that said, while we don't enforce laws or regulations, we do partner with federal agencies and state agencies who do. And that really helps us ensure that workplace protections are enforced um, and working women are aware of their workplace rights. It's important that we do strive to uplift promising practices and share helpful resources and educate our communities on successful ways to support women in the workplace. And we do that well through our stakeholder engagements, such as meetings like this. Um, these engagements really help us identify where the barriers exist for women and their families in the workplace or for women who are trying to return to the workplace. So I mentioned those two grant programs. These are the two. We have the Fostering Access Rights and Education Grant, which is also known as our FAIR grant. Um, this particular grant helps women workers who are paid low wages learn about and access their employment rights and benefits. Um, it is afforded to local entities and will help uplift community supportive resources. Um, the grantee recipients provide outreach to uh, women who are paid low wages, disseminate education materials, and help women navigate and calculate their workplace benefits. The other grant that we have is the Women in Apprenticeship and non-traditional occupations grant, which is also known as our WANTO grant. Um, this grant is used to support women's participation in a range of fields, which women are traditionally not represented. Um, these industries might include finance, technology, construction, 
manufacturing, transportation, just to kind of give you an idea. Um, a great thing about this grant is the portion of those grant funds may be used to provide supportive services. And those, those supportive services can help with um, areas like childcare assistance, um, transportation, um, tuition costs, and any work-related equipment that might be needed to be successful in the field that they are pursuing. As the grantees implement their programming, um, we're able to grow and learn and identify how they have been successful and how they have expanded pathways for women to enter and be leaders in all of these industries. Um, this technical assistance allows us to facilitate networks, improve workplace recruitment and retention strategies, along with offering support to employers and unions on establishing a successful work environment. So one of our greatest strengths is building community relationships through our, without our, throughout our region. Uh, we do research current events, areas of specialized topics. We question what's happening in our areas of coverage. Um, these conversations do lead to new connections that help bridge gaps affecting women in the workplace. Um, last fiscal year was especially unique for our region because the agency was able to bring on a new, a few new team members, which meant that we were able to expand our outreach efforts. Uh, we collaborate with several community-based organizations and professors, employers, union representatives, uh, women with lived experiences to host a variety of outreach and stakeholder engagements, um, educational webinars, Know Your Rights workshops, roundtable discussions. We've participated in annual conferences. And just to kind of give you an idea on some of our other federal partners, we've worked with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, Department of Health and Human Services, the National Labor Relations Board. Um, we've partnered with several state uh, government leaders and um, importantly, our local nonprofit organizations. We've partnered with a few different networks, such as Trades Women Network and our Bay Area Equal Pay Collaborative, where we've talked about and encouraged um, supporting women who are entering non-traditional occupations and uplifting um, equal pay opportunities. So speaking of these engagements and partnerships, you know, how might the Women's Bureau and the LA Veterans Advisory Commission collaborate? Um, there's a lot of room for partnership to uplift available community resources, um, along with expanding the women veterans voice. You know, depending on program needs or what women veterans needs are, we can really start these conversations now to identify what those challenges and barriers are for women veterans and come up with an appropriate program to fill the gaps. It's really important for the Women's Bureau to um, you know, offer the necessary support and educate women veterans on how to access resources and know their workplace rights. <clears throat> Worker organizing and empowerment. So Department of Labor has created a useful website that's full of resources for workers and employers. Um, this resource offers educational opportunities for communities um, to know what their organizing rights are, bargaining rights, um, worker protections, and advancing equity in the workplace. You know, depending on jurisdiction needs, we uplift opportunities to create a safe and equitable workplace for women and their families. I hope that has, I know that was quick and brief. I had a few minutes, but I, you know, I hope that was very helpful to kind of give you a general overview of the work that we do within the Women's Bureau. Um, you know, I really like to see how we might be able to leverage our partnership in support of our nation's women's veterans going forward. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out with any questions or concerns that you might have. Um, feel free to follow us on our Twitter, you know, check us out on DOL's website. And we do have a few exciting upcoming events some of you might be interested in. And um, we'll be hosting a three-part webinar series to mark the National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Uh, we have a webinar series on marking the Family Medical Leave Act 30th anniversary in February. And we are currently working on a training program for um, the doula community to educate on FMLA and lactation accommodations for women workers. And that particular event is actually focused out of LA. Um, so I'd be happy to share the program flyers with the LA Veterans Advisory Group um, for those interested in turning, tuning in, um, or you know the commission, I'm sorry, but feel free to 
reach out to me with any questions or concerns, our email right there, wb-western at duel.gov. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time with me today, and I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I know, I believe uh, Commissioner Gutierrez uh, was the one who requested this. Um, Commissioner, do you have any, uh, or do any of the commissioners have any follow-on questions at this time? Hi, this is Commissioner Gutierrez. Um, yeah, no, I was actually fortunate to have this presentation uh, a while back and I, and I saw the value in it, so I wanted to make it a part of the advisory uh, commission meeting. If you can, Jennifer, send that to the information to, to Stephanie so she can send it out to us uh, so we can participate in the meetings. Um, appreciate that. Will do. Thank you for having me. No, are there any other comments or questions from the other commissioners? If not, can we get the slides back? Um, do we have a representative from Metro ready for their briefing? Yes. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Marlon. Sorry, I was Wong. unmuted. Okay. Claire, I'm just, I was just going to introduce us both. I'll just start out and just trying to, in the interest Go of time, it. to keep mm. us moving. Um, hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chairman and fellow commissioners, uh, good afternoon. My name is Marlon Walker. I'm the Community Relations Manager for Metro's Purple Line. All three sections, as you may or may not know, the Purple Line is approximately nine miles of underground subway from Wilshire and Western all the way to the VA campus in West Los Angeles. Seven new stations being built, and uh, the project is not being built all at once. It's in three sections. The first section will include uh, Wilshire, West, I'm sorry, not Western, but uh, La Cienega, La Brea, and Fairfax. The next two stations, uh, four and five, will be located in Beverly Hills uh, and uh, Century City, respectively. And the last two stations, six and seven, one at UCLA at uh, at Wilshire and Westwood and the last on the campus of the VA uh, just off Bonsall Avenue. So I wanted to talk um, before I um, start. I also have joining me uh, senior, senior manager for transportation planning, arts and design, Claire Haggerty. She's going to um, provide a presentation on um, the artist uh, selection process and the outreach that was done for selecting uh, artists for uh, the VA station. So I'm here just to kind of clarify. I've been hearing recently that there's some confusion with the station naming. So in the next two minutes or so, I just hope to clarify some things that I've been hearing. I know there's some questions about whether or not the station's names are permanent at this point. Well, for all Metro projects, the once a project is uh, under construction, it has to have a station name for the station. So there are temporary names that are given to each of the seven stations. So that includes the, the future station on the VA campus. So um, that said, there are four principles that Metro uses primarily. I don't know where my slide is, but I still have my cheat sheet here so I can I can work off of that as well. So stations um, will be named under basic four principles and that's the context of the transit system. So there's context and that means that the names will reflect the location uh, relatively relative to the entire transit system so that there is not a duplicative name uh, elsewhere anywhere on the metro system. Number two is property area. That provides uh, specific information about the location uh, relative to the surrounding area. So those are two uh, uh, principles that metro uses when they're considering station name. Also neighborhood identity. Uh, acknowledge the communities and the neighborhoods serviced by the stations and the stops. And lastly, uh, with regard to names, they have to be simple. Simplicity is key because names will be short. They're easily recognizable by riders and uh, commuters passing. And also they fit on signage and mapping. So if you have a really, really long name or a complicated name uh, with a lot of letters, it's probably not gonna be easy to put on signage and on, on the trains itself. So that said, with regard to, let me see if I can find this. Sorry, just bear with me one hot second. Um, I Is have your you? slide. If it's okay to share, to share my screen. Okay, okay. I got, yes, Claire, you can, and I found it too as well. So what I wanted to say here is that for the 
uh, VA hospital station naming, that's not going to happen at the very earliest. It's going to be more than two years before we even start to consider that. So the process generally is that station names, as I just mentioned, stations are giving temporary names. Um, so when a project is approved by the Metro boards, they begin the preliminary engineering phase. In other words, when you're about six um, and less than a year out, the board, we will start. And when I say the board, actually the construction relations team, my staff, as they have already done for section one and are doing now currently in the process for doing station two will be an outreach and that means exactly what it sounds like we'll get out in the community we'll look for uh, community events that we can partner with and we'll have a booth and or a table where we pass out information specifically surveys asking people what they think the station name should be once we gather all of that information and that takes several months of outreach then the station names will be reviewed by a focus group uh, the group is comprised of both transit system riders and non riders for general public recognizability. Once that's done, the staff that focus group will submit names to the full board, full Metro board for adoption of a final set of official station names. So it's kind of a little bit of a complicated process, but uh, we want to do our due diligence to reach out to the community. And again, I just want to clarify because I've heard very recently that some people think that the names given, whether it's Wilshire Westwood, whether it's Westwood VA, that those are permanent names and they are not. Um, as I said, we won't even be beginning to do search, uh, research and outreach until at least the spring of 2025 before we begin that process. The Metro Board will have the final. Now, again, we take input from all, uh, not just individuals, but community groups, including the VA administration. Uh, the staff at the VA hospital in West LA and other veterans groups as well. All are welcome to submit their thoughts on what the station should be named. So I don't want to belabor the point, but I think you've got it. If you have any additional questions or follow up questions, let me know now, or you can shoot me an email or put it in the chat and I can respond that way. Other than that, I will make way for my colleague, Ms. Claire Haggerty. Claire, if you care to share, thank you. Thank you so much, Marlon. Um, thanks everybody for having me. So, so thank you very much for having me. Um, I wish I was at the Bob Pope Patriotic Hall right now with you all. It, I, it's a place that I uh, spent a lot of time in. I used to work for the county uh, for the Department of Arts and Culture, and I spent a lot of time during the renovation and after the renovation, um, the you know giving people tours of the artwork and. Um, and working with the artists uh, like Ken Twitchell, who did the the mural in the lobby there. So um, it is a pleasure to meet with you all today and to give you this update and uh, background on where we are um, with the artist, uh, the art program for uh, for this station and the other stations um, along the alignment. Um, so I just wanted, I know there was a, you know, there was a number of questions about the artist selection and uh, just wanted to walk you all through it. Uh, we did the artist selection for sections two and three together. So that was for four stations. And we had a 10 person art panel of community stakeholders. And those uh, stakeholders represented Beverly Hills, Century City, UCLA, and the VA, um, because we were uh, doing uh, commissioning artists for all of those stations. And the panel did include a veteran, and a veteran's family member, one of the panelists' father is um, very active in the Los Angeles County um, veteran community. And those uh, pan the panelists uh, reviewed the proposals that each of the artists uh, submitted, which included a design concept and preliminary community engagement plan. And those um, proposals were evaluated on their artistic merit, uh, as well as the appropriate appropriateness of the proposal to the station. And where did the artists come from? Uh, the artists came from our artist pool. Uh, this was a called artist that we launched in 2019. And uh, we did technical assistance workshops around the county. This was a national search um, because a number of our projects, including this one, are federally funded and must be open to um, all artists el eligible to work in the US. We had over 1,500 artists submit their qualifications in response to this call to artists. Here is um, some of the outreach that we did. I know that this was also a question. Um, you know, our outreach was to artists and and to uh, you know go to where we know artists get their information. 
We also, you know, worked with our, um, you know, local partners such as the VA, uh, sharing that information um, to share out with uh, their contacts. Um, and as I said, we did our workshops and did postings, and we had um, people actually on the street handing out postcards at, you know, uh, cafes, uh, universities, colleges, uh, where there are, you know, um, veterans, students, and, uh, and we published it in local and national publications and, um, and then some, and also on Facebook and all the social media. We have four artworks that have been commissioned for uh, for the VA uh, right now being called the Westwood VA Hospital Station, um, placeholder name. Um, we have five artists working on that station. One of the, the artists, uh, one of the artworks will be a, a, done by an artist team. And I'm gonna take this moment just to walk you through each of those artworks uh, and uh, share a little bit about them. So this is the artist team who are creating an artwork for the entrance to the station. The artwork that you see in this slide is their past artwork. This is examples of the artwork that they submitted uh, with their qualifications. And uh, they will be creating an artwork that is, their practice very much um, is abstract. It's about color, it's about light, it's about the refraction of light through prisms. Um, they also have a performance um, element to their practice. Uh, this is a sneak peek of part of their artwork design, which is in progress right now. This is the uh, plaza level of the station. So this is glass that surrounds the entrance. And for this piece, the artists took samples, field samples of colors and textures um, that they found in the environment around the station and um, integrated that into the artwork. Again, this is abstract, so the viewer will project their own thoughts and feelings onto the artwork. It's not a prescribed piece, but what it is is a very uplifting, welcoming, bright and vibrant um, welcome to the station. And this artwork will continue on the walls along the escalators as you go down into the station. As mentioned, the artists are um, also doing community engagement as part of their artworks. And this artist team will be doing an event with CalVet. Um, this, this sometime this year, um, we're just kind of waiting for the COVID to uh, kind of subside again, um, but they will be doing a um, presentation of their work um, and also bringing materials and kind of some of their tools that they use in creating their artwork to uh, give the residents at CalVet kind of a behind the scenes look at how they create their artwork. And, and as I mentioned, they're, um, they have a performance practice um, and so they're gonna be doing a performance. It'll be an interactive element to it. Uh, these artworks that are in the stations ultimately um, are just one component of years of research and artwork development um, that go into these um, artworks. So there's so much more to share um, the story of kind of how these artworks get created and these um, engagement events are opportunities to, to do that, to bring that to life. This artwork is by uh, this artist, Francesco Semetti is doing an artwork for the ticketing area. Um, again, this is his past work, and you can see from this uh, examples, he's done two transit stations before, uh, one in New York and one in Chicago. His work um, collages, in his work he collages botanics with architecture in these very dense and detailed complex um, artworks. And he's already um, completed his uh, artist-led engagement because he wanted to incorporate veterans artworks into his final piece for the station. So he held a two-day workshop and um, he took uh, residents from the VA uh, on a field trip to the Botanic Gardens at uh, UCLA and uh, shared his process, his artwork making process, and uh, mentored uh, the veterans who participated in this event in kind of how to take photographs, how to sketch, and then also how in the second day of the workshop, we were back at the VA, um, how to kind of manipulate these uh, artworks um, in such a way to kind of create a, a final piece. And, um, and some of the participants, although it was only a two-day workshop, continue to work on these pieces for months afterwards, and then, uh, you know, submitted them back to the artist and he's, uh, worked them into the composition of his um, of his artwork and that's in progress right now. So here's again just a small detail of this um, piece that will be in the ticketing area. And if you can see my cursor, 
these are two artworks by two different veterans who participated um, and their artwork is included with our permission in this final and this you know piece that will eventually be in the station. And then uh, for the concourse artwork, uh, it is being done by artist Sandow Burke. And um, these are some examples of his public artwork. Um, he has an established public art practice. He also has a gallery private practice that um, I know you're all aware of. And um, his uh, qualifications that he submitted in his application for the artist pool included only his public artwork, such as these ones pictured here. So this is uh, part of the SF Jazz um, Center um, artwork uh, on the uh, left, or sorry, right. And then he's done two commissions for Metro before. This is a Burbank uh, poster that he did. We do a poster series in our bus fleets. So this was a poster um, from our bus fleet that was commissioned in, I think, 2012, if I'm remembering correctly. And, uh, and then he's also been commissioned to do a piece for LA County, uh, Baywatch Avalon. He was commissioned to do an artwork for the lifeguard headquarters in, uh, on Catalina Island. Um, incidentally, uh, Sandow's sister was in the Coast Guard for 25 years. And uh, so he's spent a lot of time uh, on the coast. And he's already done his uh, artist engagement as well. As you can see, he's a, uh, he, he draws and um, he took participants on a tour um, of the local area on a sketching tour. Um, and everybody was invited in the, uh, this was in partnership again with the Brentwood Art Center uh, collaboration rather. And Brentwood Art Center, you know, are not only a local arts uh, institution, but they also are active uh, with arts classes and art therapy classes they, they do with working artists uh, at the VA and then at VA centers around the county. And so again, he took uh, participants on this uh, tour and we, there were stations that uh, people stopped at and were invited to draw what they saw and all of the participants were furnished with the art materials. Oh, and then he also um, did his artist talk, uh, a virtual artist talk in December that kind of shared his um, past public artwork and kind of what, you know, leading up to his uh, commission for this station and kind of the backstory of some of the um, research that he's doing for that artwork. Again, here is a, a detail. These, you know, um, just a, a small part of the artwork, but this is a detail. Um, from his piece that's in progress that shows some of the buildings on the um, VA campus. And his, as I think mentioned, um, his artwork is meant to be a panorama of Los Angeles, but centering in the area around the station. And then finally, Eloy Torres is, uh, has been commissioned to do the artwork on the platform. These are examples of his past work. If you've ever been downtown, you might have seen this large mural that he did, Anthony Quinn. And here he is in his studio with actual paintings that will be part of his artwork for this station. So again, he's doing the platform area. And um, unlike the other artworks, which are, you know, spaces of transit, people will be walking through them to get down to this platform area. His work will be the one that the riders spend the most time with as they wait for the train. Uh, he already completed his, uh, well, he's in process with his engagement, um, and he actually started that process during his proposal. Uh, he identified five local veterans and interviewed them and filmed that interview, those interviews, and is putting those interviews together into a documentary that he'll screen, um, I think later this year at the Memorial Building in Veterans Memorial Park in uh, Culver City. And uh, so each of these people are real people. And he was really interest in, interested in hearing their stories of pre-military life, military life, and post-military life. Also, a number of these um, individuals have creative pursuits, which he has um, uh, nodded to in some of the um, icons that he has in these paintings. So um, really showing these, um, you know, kind of uh, 360 degree life stories of these of these people. And then these 
portraits will be, um, these particular portraits will be above the train tunnels and kind of, you know, almost double their size as they are right now, 13 feet high, if I remember correctly. So those are all the station artworks. And um, I know that um, you are all familiar with the mural as well at uh, the intersection of Wilshire and Bonzel. And I just wanted to share about that too, because we're also working on that um, right now. So in order to build the stairs, we're calling it the North Plaza, but in order to build the stairs, escalator and elevator to, to, to bring people up to Wilshire and to access the pedestrian bridge, that will take people to the entrance to the station, um, we have to decommission a portion of the, um, the National Veterans Mural. This is something that we have been working on for years now um, and uh, working with, um, the, with Shad Mishad from the National Veterans Foundation, who was the one behind the creation of the mural with the artist Peter Stewart. Um, Peter Stewart is uh, no longer living. Uh, he died in the in the 90s before the artwork was completed. So, um, but we have actually um, also been working with another one of the volunteers who painted the mural. Uh, more on that in a minute when I show you the workshops we've that we've been doing. But... Not, uh, we've, we've got one minute left, okay? Oh, okay, I'm gonna wrap it up quick. So uh, this is really just a diagram to show kind of how much of the mural is going to remain and be protected in place and how much is going to be, um, you know, just the area where that will be decommissioned. And then the new artwork will be directly across the street. This is the impacted area. These are the areas that will not be impacted. These areas will be protected in place during construction. These areas will not be impacted. Again, will be protected during construction. And again, these areas on the south side of the wall will be protected in place during construction. Here's a picture of that I took. Of, this is Shad back in the 90s working on the mural. And this is a picture that I took when we went to visit the mural together a couple years ago. And then uh, similar to our artist selection process, we went through a, an open competitive process to bring on an arts organization piece by piece who have been doing outreach, uh, getting veteran input into the design of this um, mosaic wall, which will honor the part of the mural that will be decommissioned. And the news of this workshop reached the highest office in the land, and we were very honored to um, be asked to uh, recommend two participants from that workshop to go to Biden's press conference at the uh, construction site a few months ago. And these workshops are being uh, are being held at the Bandini Heroes Golf Course. We have two more. We've been doing this. The piece by piece have been holding this workshop since October, and we have two more workshops in January next week and the week after. And the person in this picture holding up these sketches uh, worked with Peter Stewart on the original artwork and has been a terrific bridge to that past. And here she is showing sketches that she created for the original mural. And if you're interested in learning more about these workshops. I can put um, a link in the chat. And then also just finally, the best, best, best way to find out about our projects, about our programming, about our Meet the Artists events, and about art opportunities is to subscribe to our uh, newsletter email on our website. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Marlon. Um, I know that the commissioners had sent a, a bunch of uh, questions, and uh, I'm going to defer to the other commissioners first. Um, Commissioner McFadden, uh, I believe she had a, a conflict, but are you able to, are you on, Commissioner McFadden? If not, um, I'll go to Commissioner Allman. And I know uh, Commissioner Anderson had a bunch of questions also, so we'll start with Commissioner uh, Allman. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. So I'm uh, pulling up the, the list of questions and uh, thanks both Claire and, and Marlon. So uh, the first question I offered in advance was to identify which of the panelists had served on the armed forces. I think you identified one member as being a veteran and one member being a veteran family member. Uh, the following question was any of the artists, were they veterans? And I think the answer is no, none of the artists, none of the five artists selected were, were veterans. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, but as um, mentioned in mm -hmm. the presentation, they are working, um, and some of them, one of them at least has incorporated veteran artwork into his piece. Right. Uh, the third question, how many artists were identified as veterans in the initial pool of applicants for consideration? 
that wasn't um we couldn't ask that question in because these the artist pool is used for all of metro's projects for the next few years so mm -hmm. it, and then we have the art panel that is for the particular project area and so they you know use that artist pool to um, create the finalist list for the proposals but we didn't ask um, that question okay uh, did Metro or the artist review panel take into consideration previous exhibits from prospective artists that were not submitted as part of the application process? I think you addressed that and you said no. They only reviewed the application materials that were their okay. um, qualifications submitted, yes. Uh, the next question, what is the process to name the station? I think Marlon covered that in detail. Uh, what is the process to rename a station? Has Metro ever renamed a station in its history before or after the, stage, the station reaches operational status? I'd love to jump in there and tell you I have the answer right away, but I'll have to do some research on that. To my knowledge, that, not has, that has not been done, although I know in some other cities uh, with regard to some notable uh, people, perhaps in passing, a certain station may be named or renamed after it has already been named uh, for that particular individual or group. Uh, as far as Metro, I've been here five years and I'm, I'm not aware of any station name changing after the permanent name has been assigned, but I'll find out. Okay. Do, do you know how many names have been altered as a result of the public engagement with regard to the, the final status? All right, you said the these are placeholder names, so. Yeah, the, yeah, these are placeholder names. And my understanding is the process and what we're going through right now with uh, section two, and I think we've already done section one, is uh, just prior to, or I think it's between six and, and 12 months, uh, the last engineering phase of the project. That's mm -hmm. when uh, we will actually go out and engage. In fact, we have uh, an event, uh, just got a notice for next week in Beverly Hills, because we're doing section two where we'll be joining a community event already established. And, and, and what we'll do is we'll have survey cards. We'll invite them to uh, um, let them know what the selection process is and then invite them to either do it right there as they're standing at the booth or to submit their uh, ideas and suggestions online. Once those names are uh, all gathered and the outreach is, is concluded, the names will be then submitted to a focus group, like I said, transit users and non-transit users. Um, and then they'll make a, a final uh, suggestion to the board and the board will adopt. I don't know that there's been any change once the board has made an adoption, um, but it's not impossible. So um, right. I'll just have to look into it and get you the details. OK, um, OK, I'll we'll just move on. Uh, does Metro have the authority to modify Metro commissioned artwork selections prior or after installation? If so, under what conditions? Um, can you uh, clarify a little bit? Also, we didn't sure. receive any of these questions in advance as we've been told we would. So um, just forgive me having to think on the spot oh. here. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Does Metro have the authority <clears throat> to modify Metro commissioned artwork selections prior to or after installation? If so, under what conditions? So for example, um, you know, it, it, and again, I'm just speaking for myself, you know, one or two public engagements for an art installation due in 2027 seems very, very small. Could the uh, commissioned artists be asked to do 10 public community engagements? This is a great question. Um, so the artists are, um, they have to do one artist led engagement and that you know, can be however many days they want it to be, but they are also, um, in their contract, they have to do six uh, Metro engagements. So um, to that question, and, and yes, the artworks are still in development. And um, for example, you know, we, we have meet the artist events at a certain point when the, when the designs are ready to share, and that hasn't happened yet for this um, project. So we will be doing a meet the artist event, um, you know, sometime in the near future where we'll be sharing all of the station artists um, designs um, with an opportunity to hear from from the public. Are there any other are you aware of any other situations in which a Metro Commission art contract has been modified to include um, additional community engagement? So right now I hear you know six. What if we say 20? 
or is the artist only you know uh contractually bound to do six events with with metro which could be anywhere right i mean but specific to this campus for example we heard that uh mr burke did an outreach event with with the brentwood art center uh not necessarily with with the veteran community um well there's six in their contract so you know we'd okay. have to you know but but i think that the if I'm understanding correctly, the, the the heart of the question is, are there opportunities for feedback that could be um, incorporated into the artwork at this stage? And that is still possible. There's still okay. opportunity yeah, to bit... get feedback into the artwork yeah. design that will be mm -hmm. in the station finally. Yeah. I mean, that that's one aspect to it. There are other aspects such as, mm -hmm. you know, there are uh, four projects and five artists. You know, could Metro potentially modify the contract to say uh, we would like uh, these commissioned artists to work alongside veteran artists as part of as part of this public work? I see. Yes. So that's that, that's a that's potentially doable from Metro's perspective. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, okay. they have been working alongside veterans, but more so, yes, I think that is, you know, potentially doable. And I, I've okay. heard you make that suggestion before, and I think it's a good one. Yeah, yeah and, and again, I I was under the impression that these questions were offered in, in advance. I think we all were. So it's if we have to go back and you know, maybe get something for the record, I, I totally understand that. Um, Thank you. Do you happen? That. Yeah. Do you happen to know what the total art budget was for the uh, Purple Line Extension project? So for the sections, uh, sections two and three, the the artist contracts range uh, from seventy thousand to one hundred forty nine thousand, depending mm -hmm. on the scale and size of the mm -hmm. artwork location in the station. W was but that's the just total two and three? Yeah, was the I can't, total budget? I don't know. I can't add that up right now. But uh, no, no, no. It, yeah. I, yeah. So was it specific just to you know if we do the math, you know? X amount of projects at, let's say, you know, maximum, you know, 200,000, you know, just give or take, or is there a much larger budget for the extension project? Um, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah. So I guess I'm just asking in terms of the art budget that mm -hmm. Metro has provided to this extension line. Um, do we know what that is? Well, all of our Metro art um, projects are half a percent of construction okay. but with a lot of you know exceptions <laughs> so okay. Okay. um and and we happen to have you know we're one of the oldest art and transit uh programs in the united states and we have uh -huh. the smallest percentage for art um okay. compared to our our colleagues around the nation do we know if the westwood slash va hospital station is uh on budget over budget under budget you mean as the whole, the whole project? No, or with just regard the art. to the art, just the art. Yeah, we, we, yeah. <laughs> Is there any room, any wiggle room, or are we just, you know, in terms yeah, I mean, of the art budget? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll have to get back to you on okay, sort of that's fine. questions. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, the images from the artist to properties of war exhibit no longer appear on the artist's website or have been edited. Has Metro communicated with Mr. Burke uh, since December 9th? If so, did Metro suggest that the artist alter or censor his work? The first I heard of him doing that was at your meeting on January 3rd that I heard okay. the recording of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the review process before finalizing production of art commissioned by Metro? Are there drafting or production schedules outlined in the artist contract? Um, that, I mean, I can, that would be easier just to answer kind of if we hand give me that question. But as yeah. I mentioned, we'll have an opportunity to do a meet the artist event before the artwork is, you know, is finalized. And that will okay. be an event that will, you know, where the public will be able to, um, you know, see the artworks and give us input. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, Sorry about that. I thought these were all offered in, in advance, but um, yeah, I mean, these contracts you know. are very, they're big scopes. They, they take, you know, they're, they're many years long. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chair, I'll let other commissioners ask their questions. 
All right, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, I know you had some comments and questions also. Go ahead. Yeah, you're muted. Hi, uh, Ms. Haggerty, uh, Dennis Anderson, uh, District 5. Uh, I will try to limit myself to uh, a, 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 a question and then a, a comment perhaps. So um, I, I heard the distinction, uh, the public art uh, submission and application uh, versus the private uh, body of work. And uh, do I understand correctly from the Los Angeles Times that the selection panel uh, had not seen or was not aware of the uh, depravities of art um, exhibit work? The um, art panel did not see that work in conjunction with this solicitation. That was not part of his application. Okay, fair enough. So um, I guess uh, my my comment uh, would be, and speaking as a clinician who works with veterans, uh, if it's not a universal response, it would probably be a near universal response that so many veterans would find um, the selected artists um, a body of work for his own exhibit to be so objectionable um, and that many probably are going to learn of this and 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 see that art because that's how mass communications media uh, works so it's Hello? not on it's not on it's not on you miss Haggerty but the issue I think for uh, many would be the thing that we call re-traumatization. And uh, uh, Depravities has a, a sufficient uh, exhibit that is both demonstrative of um, the artist's uh, expression and expression of opinion that uh, I, I gotta tell you, I think it's a real problem about the artist. I, I'm speaking for myself as a member of the commission, but I'm also uh, speaking for the community of veterans with whom I work as a clinical intervener. And uh, I, I can see this going further off the rails. I guess that's my comment. And um, uh, that's not a pile on, um, but it's a, profound expression of concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Noyola. Thank you so very much to both speakers. Uh, very informative. Uh, first, I would like to uh, see if we as the commissioners can get a copy of your slide presentation. Uh, okay. My question uh, really is focused on the naming. Uh, I learned quite a bit um, and uh, in my role both as commissioner as well as my uh, what I call my daytime role um, you know I'm also dealing with name changes issues in another area um, so uh, I'm really interested in that um, and apparently uh, I'm not sure if that policy that you talked about is one that's followed throughout Metro in all of its lines or happens to be on this line um, and, um, you know, it, it, and I'm glad to hear that at least you will take input from uh, the local area. Uh, you have some criteria, uh, but what I'm not hearing is that that criteria doesn't seem to really focus in uh, and at least uh, prioritize the local concerns um, for naming. Uh, yes, I understand you can't have a very long name. Uh, but, you know, what name can you have that emphasizes and prioritizes the local community in which the station is serving? Thank you. Thank you, Vice. Are there any other comments from other commissioners at this time or questions? All right. Um, I, I would like to add that, um, you know, you've heard some of these concerns from the public comments from 
our, our local constituents. Um, one of them brought this issue to our uh, concern, and, and I think all of us as a veteran commission are very concerned, not necessarily about the artists themselves, but the selection process. Um, it's clear that uh, it was really great to see how involved some of the artists were in, uh, in, in, in incorporating veteran input and support. Um, and I would hope that in the future, you can leverage this commission as well, as well as the MVA. Um, we have uh, many veteran service officer organizations around here. Um, and uh, it's, it's it just seems like a missed opportunity um, to not engage more. And hopefully uh, as a commission, we can make a recommendation to the supervisors. Um, and, and just to remind everybody, as we passed our bylaws, our duties are basically to consult and advise Department of Military and Veteran Affairs in matters concerning our veterans. Also, we obviously study and advise and recommend to the board of supervisors on special problem areas, which this may be one of them, even though the board of supervisors is not, uh, you know, they're just on the board of Metro, but there's a much larger board. And also we serve as a means of communication within the county. And so this is a way for everyone to hear from our veteran constituents about their concerns. And um, the last thing I would add as the chair is that just a reminder that this station is on VA property. And I think that that's a very unique proposition and a very challenging proposition for this community. And there are many feelings and history that's involved there. And I think it, the, the more veteran engagement we can get moving forward um, would, would be beneficial. Um, you know, obviously you guys could not have known art that you had not seen, but I, I think you can all imagine the feelings and frustration and trauma that uh, a lot of that art can reflect upon our veteran community um, that will primarily be using this metro station to get services at that station or come to work to serve our veterans. So. Um, I thank you for your time and, and um, we'll send this list of uh, questions. We had, some other commissioners had some questions, but they're not present. So um, we'll send them to you to uh, make sure um, they get um, a response. But we appreciate your time and um, thank you for giving your presentation. Thank you for allowing us to have the time. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to say that our we're still working. We're, this is all work in progress and we are thrilled to have more contacts and really appreciate the input that you've given us and look forward to continuing working with you all. Thank you. Jose, can you bring back up the slides, please? Next slide. Director Zenner, sorry, we uh, haven't left you a lot of time, but. No, I, I, it's quite okay. I, I don't have a whole lot. Um, and I, I have to start by apologizing. Uh, Chair, you, you sent me an email about 40 something minutes before this meeting asking if I had sent the questions. Um, I was under the impression that I did and I just checked and I didn't. So um, Metro and, and uh, the commission, I am uh, responsible and apologize for that. Uh, that mishap and I will uh, forward those questions over to Metro uh, immediately after this meeting. Um, other issues. Um, so today um, I, it's the first time that I've experienced it on the commission, but um, the interruptions. Um, so I just wanted to publicly say that we're going to look at changing the uh, format of the teams meetings in the future. We're going to do it to where you have to like presenters will have certain uh, privileges and then uh, attendees will have certain privileges. So we're going to start uh, bifurcating the uh, the meeting uh, invites for the virtual platform just so that our uh, speakers and uh, you all are, uh, your time is respected and uh, you're not interrupted. I uh, also wanted to bring up um, the uh, desire to take the commission back to quarterly in person. Um, so we would like to uh, return uh, once a quarter to in-person meetings, the department. Um, so putting that out there for the commission. 
Um, we will we remain committed to making sure that we're streaming those meetings, uh, the commission meetings that are in person and making sure that that we maintain a way for virtual public interaction um, to keep that going and continue to hang uh, those videos and everything on the uh, website as we've designed. And then uh, last thing specifically for the commission, uh, we have a lot of outstanding trainings. Um, we should have been we should be working with you on getting virtual access to those trainings, um, but we're also in the process of scheduling uh, tours with with each SD. So um, I think Stephanie has been uh, reaching out to the commission. So if you would um, respond to her and get something scheduled, we'd like to give you a uh, personal tour of the Bob Hope Patriotic Hall and then just get uh, feedback um, from each SD uh, commission around the needs of your constituents and um, really kind of start planning our quarterly town halls um, out in your community. So um, that's really it on my end, uh, Chair. And again, my my apologies to uh, the commission and uh, to Metro. Chair, can I ask a follow up for Director Zenner? Go ahead. Uh, Director, are we moving to just quarterly meetings or quarterly in person with virtual in between? Yeah, sorry for the lack of clarification. So it'd be monthly uh, with quarterly in person. So it'd be two virtual followed by a quarterly in person. That sounds great. I, I fully support that for, for what it's worth, but that's an opportunity for us to continue a dialogue while, you know, coming together post COVID and coming together as a community of Bob Hope. So I look forward to that. All right, next slide. Thank you, uh, Director Zinner. I think uh, Commissioner Noyola has his hand up, uh, Chair. Uh, OK. Um, go ahead, Vice. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Director, if there's any way that we can get some clarity between the uh, information that we've been receiving from uh, the Commission's Bureau, I guess it's called, about uh, returning to in-person, uh, I'm seeing it, it, I may be either misunderstanding what they're saying or maybe perhaps there's a lack of clarity of what's you know, how we're going to approach going back towards in-person meeting, uh, particularly once the emergency declaration uh, expires on March 4th or 8th, I think it is. Um, so uh, if we could just get some additional clarity on uh, the direction from the, uh, I guess, uh, the commission secretary, I'm not sure what her title is. Uh, that would be great. I, I think we all received an email uh, recently within the last week or two. OK, yeah, we'll Thank reach you. out to Commission Services and get that clarity. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. All right, next slide. All right, here's the list of some of the uh, agenda items that we've been talking about. Um, Commissioner uh, Jackson Kelly, are you still on? Uh, I'm not sure if she's on. She was on earlier, um, but if there's more um, in this in, the, in this time, I'm going to cut this short. But if uh, there's other um, items that commissioners would like to add to upcoming meetings, please uh, let Stephanie know, um, and we'll get them uh, addressed and added to the ag agenda for future meetings. Next slide. All right, for the good of the order, let's uh, run through real quick. I know we're at time, but I wanted to hear from all the commissioners. Thank you. Commissioner Liao. Hello, Chair. I don't have anything at this moment. It's been a very informative meeting. Thank you, everybody that stepped up and everybody that requested this meeting. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. But at this time, I don't have anything to put out. Thanks. Commissioner Jackson Kelly, are you, are you there? I think she had to drop off. Uh, Commissioner Allman? Yeah, I just wanted oh. to use my time to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think uh, Commissioner Jackson Kelly is on. I'm sorry. Don't mean to cut I you yield. off. I yield. Sorry, ma'am. Are you able to? We can't hear you right now. We see you, though. I think you're on mute still.
I don't know if she's having technical difficulties. I'm assuming she's going to call in. Um, Commissioner Allman, you want to go ahead and we'll just swing back to her? Sure. I just wanted to, you know, reflect a little bit on, you know, what we heard from, from Metro and, you know, this, this ongoing situation with, with the artist selection. I mean, you know, from my vantage point, um, you know, I, I, I believe that we've illuminated some flaws in the Metro selection process by which, you know, Metro selected artists where previous past private works could, you know, come back around and, you know, cause issues for, for the public art uh, that, that they were selected for. Um, I, I don't think that's unique to this station. I think that this is a, a, a problem that Metro could have experienced anywhere in uh, the service area. It just happened to be um, on, on this campus. And, you know, with respect to, you know, Mr. Burke's work, I, I really think that, you know, we have to look at this in terms of the past and the future. Um, were the past works um, objectionable to the veteran community? I think all of us would, would agree that, you know, perhaps they, they were even repugnant. But, you know, is this an opportunity to create dialogue and bridge the military civilian divide. And, and, and that's what I really focus on when thinking about this situation. Uh, I, I really hope that as a commission, we can look forward into fostering, um, you know, richer cultural collaboration with other groups outside the veteran community. And I, uh, I would urge my fellow commissioners to think about that as we consider a recommendation moving forward. Thanks, Commissioner Allman. Uh, Commissioner Jackson Keller, are you back with us? I am. Sorry, ma'am. Go you ahead. Hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Um, well, I am very pleased with the results of the meeting with Metro. I thought they did an excellent job of presenting. And uh, I, I thank Commissioner Allman for bringing up my concern of naming of the stations. And I still think that we don't really have a clear picture of that. And I would like additional information on that. That's all that I, I have to say. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Vice? Thank you very much. It was a very uh, productive and fruitful meeting today. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes, um, for me, it was just uh, like just to thank all the presenters today. Very informational meeting. Uh, so I appreciate uh, all, all their time and effort coming out to speak with us. Um, but that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Anderson? Yes, uh, taking... Uh, Note that we have for the next meeting agenda uh, discussion of the station naming, which uh, appears to be of, of real concern, so needs to be addressed. Uh, but if I understand that it will be at the next meeting where we have really a robust discussion of uh, what our recommendation will be, uh, particularly in reference to uh, the artist and the art. I, I hope that's going to be also uh, within the uh, uh, agenda. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, um, I'll finish off. Um, you know, I think that we all have a lot to think about when it comes to making a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Um, it's important to remember our role in and what our charter, what our, our bylaws charter us to do, uh, as limited as it is, but I think that we, it's imperative that we make uh, a statement and recommendation regarding this. Um, it's just, um, it's an unfortunate situation, but this is, uh, as, as many people have stated, a very traumatizing, uh, even if unintentional um, situation. And so just a reminder to the commission that 
um, recommendations need to be are due to the executive committee uh, at least two weeks before the next commission. And so hopefully we will be able to uh, have a have a robust discussion uh, regarding that uh, and have something beneficial that we can send forward to the Board of Supervisors um, moving forward. Are there any other uh, comments from the Commission? Next slide. Uh, thanks again for everybody to the presenters. Um, I think there will be a continued discussion on this uh, issue, but um, hopefully we can find ways to be productive moving forward uh, for all parties involved and to ensure that we continue to hear the concerns of our veteran community here. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned.